Good afternoon. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's working. Um, awesome. Well, thank you, Sanji, for being here. Um, we actually recently met in Vegas at 2020, so uh, very excited to hang out in, I guess, our kind of our hometown here of Washington, D.C. Um, but why don't we start? I know you have a disclaimer you have to give sure. as a reminder, um, but why don't you also introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background um, as well as your current role? Perfect. Uh, again, thank you for having me. My name is Sanjeev Bhaskar. I'm our United States Digital Currency Council here with the Department of Justice. Our standard disclaimer would be I am speaking in my personal capacity, not officially on behalf of the department. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. So thank you to Kristen and the Blockchain Association for inviting us. I've had a great time today listening to a lot of great speakers and interacting with you, with you all, our colleagues really in the crypto universe here in the hallway and throughout the conference. Uh, by way of background, I am a federal prosecutor. Originally from Ohio, I was a prosecutor there. I was a federal prosecutor in Texas, Charlotte, North Carolina, and then uh, our crypto practice developed in North Carolina, and I came recently to Washington now to serve as our United States Digital Currency Council with our digital currency initiative here in the Department of Justice. And that is housed in our money laundering asset recovery section, which we lovingly refer to as MLARs, uh, consisting of really uh, investigating a lot of money laundering, asset forfeiture recovery cases involving cryptocurrency, things of the like, and prosecuting those investigations. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about DOJ's MLARs Digital Currency Initiative? Um, and then also I know a year ago you established NSET, um, which you'll have to tell everyone what yeah, that stands for. Absolutely. Um, but can you talk about the work uh, that you and your team have been doing on, on these two initiatives? Sure. So our Digital Currency Initiative, which many of you may be familiar with, if not, I'm glad to discuss and share with uh, really, it's the pillar and the foundation of our crypto practice in the department. It's been around since 2018 or so, and we have four areas we focus on. One is we prosecute cases. We're federal prosecutors, so prosecuting your traditional money laundering, drug trafficking, ransomware investigations, all involving crypto, and assisting really on the asset forfeiture side of that when it comes to crypto recovery and handling duty calls from the field, including from companies reporting victimization of crypto fraud. Uh, additionally, we do a lot of training when it comes to uh, defining, you know, what is crypto wallets and keys, uh, being mindful, all of us, myself included, had our first aha moment where we had to say, what is a crypto wallet? What are crypto keys? What is this blockchain? So we do a lot of training to educate the public and law enforcement. Uh, we do a lot of policy work when it comes to reviewing legislation that is proposed by Congress, seeing does it fit the laws we have in the land and what changes we can make. And then finally, as we move forward this year in 2022, the fourth pillar of our digital currency initiative has been public-private sector engagement, understanding the importance of what our colleagues do here uh, in the audience and being able to learn from you uh, when it comes to emerging technologies, uh, what are zero-knowledge proofs, what is proof-of-staking consensus, things that maybe we perhaps take for granted if we're involved in the crypto sphere, but others do not know, and being able to engage and learn what is good technology uh, when it comes to the crypto sphere, and how can we encourage that here in the United States? So in a nutshell, that is what the Digital Currency Initiative it is. I have another colleague of mine, Paul Hemiseth, who's in the West Coast uh, in a similar role. And together, we, uh, with our supervisors and colleagues at MLARS, have developed this initiative. Uh, building upon the Digital Currency Initiative, the Department of Justice this year developed the NSET, which Kristen referred to, the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team, which we are also part of, uh, that is comprised of about 20 or so federal prosecutors throughout the United States, some uh, from assistant U.S. US attorney's offices throughout the United States, where our colleagues are still situated there working remotely, and then we have about half of us here in Washington. The goal of the NSET was to be able to attack high-level, complex uh, cryptocurrency crime and matters, fraud, ransomware, the like, things I've mentioned earlier that are more of an institutional nature. Being able to work these investigations and being able to help those in the field become conversant with crypto and understanding how these investigations work. Uh, and that's been sort of the genesis of the NSET. And as we move forth now into uh, the end of 2022 and 2023, we've also developed through the NSET and with the help of the Digital Currency Initiative, the Digital Asset Coordinator Network, the DAC Network. If you've read of that, we've now placed specific subject matter experts in each of the 94 federal districts who are also federal prosecutors to help with maybe more of the run-of-the-mill crypto cases because ultimately every victim is a victim and they value the loss they suffer. And regardless of the dollar value and the crime involved, we want to make sure that we have support in each of the 94 districts throughout our great country, educating each other and making sure we can address crypto fraud uh, when it arises. 
Um, let's dig into a recent um, public case. Uh, there was the seizure of funds related uh, to Silk Road um, that were stolen back in 2012. Um, what can you tell us about this, and what does it say about the ability to investigate, investigate and prosecute cases? Absolutely. So uh, what Chris is referencing, I'm sure many here are familiar with the whole Silk Road marketplace that was taken down back in 2012. Uh, a dark web marketplace where narcotics were sold, among other items of an illicit nature. Uh, we would later learn when the takedown happened that other parties stole money from the Silk Road marketplace. Uh, specifically at that time, roughly 50,000 Bitcoin. And then uh, that happened in 2012. In 2017, Bitcoin had a hard fork. Bitcoin Cash came about. So now the culprits had both Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And law enforcement continued to trace the cryptocurrency, continued to work the investigation. And lo and behold, we get to November of 2021. Uh, there was an arrest and takedown in Georgia where we were able to, law enforcement as a whole, identify where crypto is being stored on unhosted wallets, seize the wallets in the target's house, ultimately arrest the target. The target recently pled guilty in the Southern District of New York to wire fraud and agreed to forfeit the 50,000 or so Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, which at the time of seizure, for those paying attention to the crypto markets in November of last year, was worth roughly $3.36 billion. So these are the types of cases that we know if we use uh, the blockchain tracing tools that exist, the TRM Labs, Chain Analysis, Elliptic, so on and so on, uh, not to limit who we use, there's a variety of tools, but if we utilize these tools and work together, we can trace the funds, stop crime, make the victims whole, and then encourage good, good crypto uh, economy and crypto technologies here in the United States. That is a lot of Bitcoin. That's a lot. <laughs> I've got some ideas for that, but that <laughs> wasn't on the pre-approved script. But um, uh, so I know NSET also, um, obviously, we had the executive order uh, that President Biden issued right. last March, and we saw a lot of reports that uh, resulted from that this fall. And I know NSET uh, was responsible for leading the drafting of two of those reports, um, one on uh, international cooperation and the second one on illicit finance finance risks. Um, can you maybe take some time and walk us through those two reports and some of the conclusions that, that, that were found? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the main focuses of this administration has been this whole of government approach, which I think we'll talk about at some length today. The, the idea being each of the various components in government, treasury, state, justice, so on and so on, are working together to address this issue involving digital assets, what they are, what's the future, what risks are involved. Within the purview of the Department of Justice, we worked on, and this would be the NSET, myself and my colleagues, working on reports uh, that address two areas. First, international law cooperation. And then secondly, dealing with the illicit finance and how law enforcement is investigating that in the whole digital asset sphere. With regards to the first report, again, that being focused more towards international law enforcement cooperation. Uh, and I should say, all of these reports are public. Uh, you're able to read these reports. They're available publicly. You can download them. They're on the Department of Justice website for your own uh, enjoyment if you wish to read it in more detail. But the first report, the international report, came with three recommendations. One is we need to do a better job as law enforcement when it comes to educating each other on sophisticated crypto technology. I mentioned earlier uh, zero-knowledge proofs, decentralized finance, things of that nature. We need to level the playing field because crypto is a very transient international game, right? I mean, transactions are happening all over the place. I've met so many great colleagues today that have traveled here to D.C., to our great city, from all over the world. We need to make sure the support you're getting in the United States is consistent with what's happening internationally. Second, the importance of real-time evidence sharing and deconfliction amongst law enforcement when it comes to investigations that are being run. Uh, we have targets, of course, that try to avoid the United States, go to different countries, and we need to share that intelligence information in a real-time uh, period. And then finally, and perhaps most important to this audience, is the importance of uniform regulation when it comes to digital assets. And that involves continuing to engage with the FATF, with the Financial Action Task Force when it comes to the travel rule, specifically recommendations 15 and 16 and emerging technologies. And also now the MICA, the markets and crypto assets in Europe, and this concept of a passportable uh, ability for companies to work throughout Europe if they're established in one specific country and approved there in accordance with AMICA. And, and what we've learned is as a government, and really as government as a whole, 
is uniform regulation throughout the world is very important in the digital asset arena because if we do not have that, criminals will run to certain countries that are not establishing anti-money laundering or combating the financing of terrorism protocols, and they will try to establish and set up shop there. And that does no good to those companies, perhaps yourself, that are doing things the right way and are trying to incorporate and do things the right way and have the right KYC, AML guidelines in place. So that's where we, we focused ourselves really on the international report. Pivoting to the recent domestic, or I would say law enforcement addressing illicit financial risks in crypto, which came out this September of uh, 2022. We really wanted to spend some time addressing areas that we are seeing illicit actions happening in the crypto arena. Those included types of crypto payments, uh, areas where mixers and tumblers are used to conceal identities and payments, and finally, just the facilitating of fraud altogether, traditional fraud through areas of digital assets, uh, in addition to other crimes, ransomware, terrorism, so on and so on. Uh, that was the, the initial uh, areas of addressing this report. And then we pivoted to decentralized finance, talking about what is DeFi and is something truly decentralized? And if someone is uh, labeling themselves as decentralized in nature, is that true? Are there centralized attributes? And how we address this? Uh, the recommendations that we gave at the end of this report, among others, were uh, we recommend the private sector when we are dealing with DeFi or really digital assets as a whole to be cognizant if the government sends you legal process when it comes to a subpoena or a search warrant of that nature for information of your customers, not to notify your customers because if the customer knows that they're being investigated, we call that an anti-tip-off provision, perhaps they will move their assets or they will run. And, and we've encouraged Congress, and again, this is public information here, to join us uh, in amending some of our statutes specifically regarding financial institutions to create protections where uh, customers are not notified if subpoenas are sent regarding their information. Additionally, we recommended in this report of expanding the statute of limitation when it comes to investigating crimes of a digital asset nature. Now, you may, may or may not know this, but majority of federal offenses have a five limit or five year, excuse me, five year statute of limitation when it comes to prosecuting offenses. Uh, once they're identified, there are some specific examples uh, that are, are exceptions for certain enumerated offenses. But when it comes to digital assets, Kristen mentioned earlier the 2012 hacking of the Silk Road marketplace. And we don't want to be limited when it comes to investigating these cases. We, we encourage Congress to join us in ex expanding these statute of limitations. So these two reports, the international report and the illicit finance report, attempts to address areas of concerns we have, lay the landscape for what things look like now, and then encourage Congress and really the private sector itself uh, on things we recommend as we move forward here in 2023. Um, so what are the risks that DOJ are focused on now? And then you mentioned something earlier, this whole of government approach. Can you go a little bit deeper on that as well? Sure. You know, there's a, there's a lot of risks that we're cognizant of right now in the crypto sphere. We saw what happened last week. We're cognizant in real time of what's taking place. Uh, again, as we documented in, this, in these public executive order reports, when it comes to decentralized finance, this is an emerging technology that many people still do not understand. And the importance of having transparency in decentralized platforms is to everyone's benefit. That includes uh, auditing of smart contract codes. That includes educating others in the pr uh, public sector or the private sector, excuse me, of the risk involved when you engage with some of these platforms. And I think as we continue to educate and share this information and do uh, self-regulation really on the side of the private sector, I think we can really advance decentralized finance in those areas. Uh, with regards to the whole of government approach, Again, this is the uh, guidance coming down from the administration. We are working together with our counterparts at Treasury, the SEC, CFTC, so on and so on, when it comes to addressing the issues and challenges that are facing the crypto community nowadays. I know my colleague Jonathan Fishman is going to speak later about the work they're doing with the FATF and the uh, virtual currency working group. The dialogue continues. We're working together. We're communicating. Uh, the SEC has done a great job of opening up a fin hub where you can dialogue with the SEC when it comes to questions regarding technology and whether there's something's a security. The CFTC has their office of technology. Well, they'll engage with you with discussions about commodities. We have our digital currency initiative here at the department where we're, you know, we're glad you engage with the private sector. That's what we're doing today, right? We're walking around and talking and trying to learn from you and understand how technology exists. So for better or for worse, there is engagement, there is communication from the government as a whole. And to be encouraged, we, we hope to keep doing that as we move forward uh, throughout 2023. 
Um, so I guess the kind of final question I have for you today is obviously you're dealing with a private sector industry audience here. Um, do you have any messages for us? How are, how are you engaging with, with actors in the crypto industry that are trying to do the right thing? And what can industry be doing to better help you with your job? No, again, thank you for inviting us. It's so important to be here and to engage with each other. Uh, I'm learning from you daily, and hopefully you've picked up some nuggets of information this afternoon as well. And the first thing I would say is, again, as we've documented in these executive orders, you are the first line of defense. You are the first line of defense when it comes to fraud and protecting the community. Uh, we encourage the private sector and industry to self-regulate. When you see issues of fraud or suspicious activity to report, when you see concern amongst your colleagues, address that. The burden in some, um, some level falls upon you to represent crypto as a whole because co the consumer base is coming to you when it comes to their business and wanting to learn from you about cryptocurrency, digital assets, blockchain, tech, blockchain technology, NFTs, so on and so on and so on. So it's the first thing is this, you are the first line of defense and you play a very, very important role. The second thing I would add is the importance of compliance. I mentioned our money laundering asset recovery section, and we have a bank integrity unit. We look at a lot of compliance issues when it comes to financial institutions. You should, if you are doing work substantially in the United States, register with FinCEN, with the Financial Crime Enforcement Network. You should establish anti-money laundering protocols. You should generate suspicious activity reports. Things of this nature help protect not only the community as a whole when crime happens, but also you yourself. As, and I can think of many examples where we've relied on that infrastructure where unfortunately companies have been victimized by hacks and DeFi and bridges the like to rely on that information to help them root out where the problem happened and what caused the challenge. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing as we've sort of spoken with a lot of conferences now throughout not just the United States, but really the world in crypto, has been trying to take the temperature of the concerns that the industry has when it comes to crypto crime and regulation, things of the like. And one of the questions I often get is, uh, Sanjeev, how do we secure the metaverse? How do we secure Web 3.0? What's the future? And if, if we have the protocol running on its own and we walk away, are we, are we on our own? How do we go ahead and address these situations? And I think these are concerns that we need to have on the front end. When you develop the technology, Think about situations in which if you needed to gather information later, how you could do that and how you could protect crime from happening with these technologies. I'll mention, and I don't want to mention any specific companies, there's a lot, but my friend Gary Weinstein, Electric Coin Company, and others who discuss about the future of privacy going forward in 2023. I mean, there's a reality. We have an ongoing discussion about privacy blockchains, private coins, but there's a confluence of if we will encourage privacy coins and private blockchain, how can we do that yet still be in compliance with the current regulations we have in our land? And I think as we move forward with this privacy discussion, with the DeFi discussion, we must be mindful, again, how can we secure this technology so it's not abused? At the same point in time, how can we encourage the technology to be in compliance with current regulations so we can help assist those when they are victimized and also, finally, encourage good technology in the United States, encourage good emerging technology that will advance the crypto sphere, but also advance good legal technology that will be for the benefit of all, all involved. And that's what I'd share with you. And um, again, we are here. I'll be here throughout the conference. We're glad you engage and learn. We are learning from you as well, and be mindful of that as well. We're in this together. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much.